I'm Charles Saraceno of the Terra Firma Party. With Armistice Day coming soon, we're making our voices heard by the alien appeasers on the Presidium. Can I count on your support in the next election? You're marking the end of the first contact war with a protest. As we have every year for the last 26 years. The war taught humanity a lesson that some would forget. If we don't stand up for ourselves, no one else will. I thought the lesson of the first contact war was that there's other life in the galaxy and they have opinions too. Perhaps so, Commander. But if aliens feel free to express their opinions at gunpoint, why shouldn't we? What happened at the mass relay was a misunderstanding. If you saw a child about to touch a gun, wouldn't you stop them? I'd pull them away, yes. I wouldn't shoot them dead. I don't know Terra Firma's platform. What do you stand for? Our core value is that Earth must stand firm against alien influences. Politically, culturally, and in the worst case, militarily. It's a good theory, but these people are making it sound like a racial issue. I can't deny that some of our supporters have extreme views, but our platform is also supported by economists, sociologists, and medical professionals. But you don't do anything to curtail the racist comments of your members. Of course not, Commander. Whether I disagree with them or not, they have the right to express their opinion. Sorry, I believe we need to work peacefully with other races. We've heard that before in human history. Well-meaning naivete leads to declarations of peace in our time. We can't allow anything like Shanxi to happen again. I'm Andrew Yang and I approve this message. By polluting the oceans, not mitigating CO2 emissions, and destroying our biodiversity, we are killing our planet. Let us face it, there is no planet B. On this issue, it may happen we have disagreements between the United States and France. It may happen, like in all families. But that's, for me, a short-term disagreement. On the long run, we will have to face the same realities, and we're just citizens of the same planet. So we will have to face it. So beyond some short-term disagreements, we have to work together with business leaders and local communities. Let us work together in order to make our planet great again and create new jobs and new opportunities while safeguarding our Earth. I'm Professor McCoy, and we just saw a couple of examples of the dark side of humanism. Humanism as an ethical and political theory has a lot of positive aspects to it. There's the unity among all human beings for a common purpose, a common goal, without the sort of divisions that we have historically seen between races, between ethnicities, between nations, between anything else. It is a general, overarching, broad philosophy, one which unites every human being together. The trouble arises with a broader context, the kind of context you see in science fiction, the kind of context you see especially in the example we've looked at from Mass Effect. This is an example I've spoken about on my various live streams as well, uh, which you can find uh, linked in the description or on my channel. And it's a common example in a lot of science fiction where we see this sort of humanism, this human supremacy even, turn into something significantly darker than what we see in modern society today. It's no accident that I use, uh, use the term dark side, uh, because for example, uh, another example of this would be uh, the Galactic Empire from Star Wars, especially from the Star Wars Legends continuity where the Empire was distinctively pro-human, and of course, the converse of that, anti-alien. Or we should maybe say anti-non-human. So, we see humanism, this 
overarching, over, uh, broad-reaching philosophy, which encompasses everyone and everything into a cohesive moral system, turn on its head and turn into it just another exclusionary philosophy, an exclusionary ethical and political system, as soon as humanity is brought into a broader, wider context with other rational animals, other creatures um, that an unfortunately underutilized term in science fiction, heterosapiens, other wise animals, other rational animals. As soon as these heterosapiens, as soon as these aliens or what have you are brought into play, brought into the picture, suddenly humanism becomes indistinguishable from any other sort of racism or chauvinism that we may have seen over throughout human history. But why is this? What is so wrong with humanism that leads it to become this kind of this kind of isolationist, racialist, insular kind of philosophy like any other racialist or ethnic or nationalist ethic that we have seen before? Well, I'm going to give a couple of more examples and then we'll go into the uh, a more in-depth analysis and look at exactly what it is about humanism that has this uh, that gives it uh, this problem. Uh, and it's a problem of making the proper distinctions. I know things are different aboard the Normandy, but uh, I'm I'm concerned about the aliens, Vicarian and Rex. With all due respect, Commander, should they have full access to the ship? They may not serve the Alliance, Chief, but they're allies. At least as far as Saren goes. This is the most advanced ship in the Alliance Navy. I don't think we should give them free reign to poke around the vital systems. Engines, sensors, weapons. You don't trust the Alliance's allies? I'm not sure I'd call the Council races allies. We, humanity, I mean, have to learn to rely on ourselves. Standing up for ourselves doesn't mean standing alone. I don't think we should turn down allies. I just think we shouldn't bet everything on them staying allies. As noble as the council members seem now, if their backs are against the wall, they'll abandon us. You've got a pessimistic view of the universe, Williams. A pessimist is what an optimist calls a realist. Look, if you're fighting a bear and the only way for you to survive is to sick your dog on it and run, you'll do it. As much as you love your dog, it isn't human. It's not racism, not really. Members of their species will always be more important to them than humans are. These seem like deeply held beliefs, Williams. What made you think this way? My family's defended the Alliance since it was founded. My father, grandfather, great-grandmother, they all picked up a rifle and swore the oath of service. I guess we just tend to think of Earth's interests as our own. And it turns out that everybody on Earth is descended from people that live here in Africa. And then as groups of us moved around the world, the color of our skin had to change. But we're all one species, but we're not treating each other fairly. Not everybody's getting an even shake. So it's time to change. Shepard, you're making a habit of costing me more than time and money. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm getting a lot of bullshit on this line. Don't try my patience. The technology from that base could have secured human dominance in the galaxy against the Reapers and beyond. Human dominance or just Cerberus? Strength for Cerberus is strength for every human. Cerberus is humanity. I should have known you'd choke on the hard decisions. Too idealistic from the start. I've sacrificed more for humanity than you'll ever know. Everything, Shepard, everything I've done has uplifted humanity. Not only above other species in our galaxy, but over the Reapers. Powerful, terrifying, spectacular. Each eruption is a window into the earth beneath our feet. Volcanoes fire our imagination. They inspire myths and legends and tempt our curiosity out beyond the confines of our world. Funny to hear the elusive man already coming up with pro-Earth propaganda in the late 20th century. That was uh, at least the elusive man's voice actor, uh, Martin Sheen, from an eyewitness documentary talking about uh, the wonders of the Earth, uh, among many others. Uh, and of course, among many other, uh, among other examples as well. We see here 
uh, we see in cases like this a kind of preference for humanity, preference for our planet, our world, because it is ours. Not because it's better, not because there's anything particularly distinct about it, but because it's ours. It's an identitarian philosophy, innately. Rather than being uh, having something to do with the intrinsic characteristics of humanity or Earth or anything like that, it's a sort of pride in ourselves, which represents humanism as such. Now, there have been attempts to change humanism. Um, some of these have to do with personalist um, or, uh, or agent causal um, distinctions where we where we distinguish human from person. Well, this can be done, and we can distinguish humans from persons and value one or the other, uh, or both differently. The trouble is that once you start to delineate human from person, that can lead in two directions. One direction that can lead uh, is what I would uh, what I would the more dangerous direction, especially historically speaking, where we start to discount the personhood of humans, of homo sapiens. This is where we get the various uh, explicitly racialist or, eth uh, or ethnic or supremacist philosophies, where some groups, some subset of human beings are considered sub-personal. Colloquially, colloquially, we would say subhuman. Um, but this is uh, imprecise. Right? We are talking about humanism, um, but in this more narrow personalist sense, then we're talking about persons as the uh, as the holders of moral value. And of course, I would agree that persons are the holders of moral value. However, I think it is quite dangerous once we begin to separate human from person in this way, because again, historically and even presently. We have the danger of discounting the personhood of real human beings. So, the alternative to this uh, is to separate conceptually human from person, but broaden our understanding of person or the possibilities of what could constitute a person beyond mere the bi merely the biological category of Homo sapiens to uh, what I've called and what uh, what has been. Again, I think an underutilized term in science fiction, heterosapiens, other rational animals. Other things of the same sort as us, but of a different biological species. I insist on saying biological species in part because um, I think it would be, at least in some circumstances, perfectly fair to refer to heterosapiens, aliens, so to speak, um, as human in the philosophically relevant sense, in the sense which would be uh, what we might call metaphysical species, species as differentiated by what Aristotle called a specific difference, the part of us that specifies us from something else, from one thing from another. So the specific difference, the speciation, what, def what defines humans as a species, is rationality. We are rational animals. We're of the genus, the broader category of animals, of a specific kind in particular. But what separates us from other species of animal is our rationality. Of course, what separates heterosapiens, aliens, from other species of animals is, of course, their rationality as well. So, philosophically, metaphysically, if we share the same specific difference, while our biology may differ, and may even differ significantly, our specific difference, our what one would call species in the philosophical, um, metaphysical, or at least Aristotelian sense, would be the same, especially for moral purposes. So this, I think, is the sort of way out of this, and this is how we ought to consider humanism. Because I think humanism is a perfectly coherent moral system and moral category. The trouble is that it needs to be expanded out beyond a biological essentialist definition of human. If we think of human in terms of biological species, then as soon as we encounter non-human rational animals, if we encounter, I shouldn't say this is a necessary 
a necessary development that will happen, but if we were to encounter non-homo sapiens, rational animals, or is what I'm calling hetero sapiens, if we were to encounter this sort of thing, humanism would have to wrestle with the idea that there are humans in the philosophical sense, which are not human in the biological sense. Now, for, uh, if for any of you who are interested in the prior topic in this issue of are all human beings persons, um, I invite you to look at my, uh, my couple of videos, uh, particularly the, uh, the one on Aristotle and the soul, uh, as to what differentiates an organism or a living being, uh, which is its, its specific difference shortly. Uh, so that, that video will also be linked in the description, so you can find that there as well. In any case, I think I will leave us, uh, I could, of course, leave off with a, uh, with a rousing, uniting, uh, going, uh, a uniting speech by Commander Shepard from the Mass Effect series uh, that goes beyond this mere biological humanism uh, and into something more, something more uniting between biological species, but all being, uh, all being human in the relevant sense, all being people. But I think instead I want to leave us with something a little more lighthearted. So I will leave, uh, I will leave uh, my I think, uh, I think my better way of a uh, better way forward for humanism uh, to a different, um, a different character from science fiction. That would be Captain Kirk uh, from Star Trek, uh, in a much more lighthearted and much friendly conversation with his with his old friend Mr. Spock. So until next time, I'll leave it to Captain Kirk, and and I will see you in the next video. Thanks for coming by. Is it possible that we two, you and I, have grown so old and so inflexible that we have outlived our usefulness? Would that constitute a joke? Don't crucify yourself. It wasn't your fault. I was responsible for no actions but your own. That is not what you said at your trial. I was as captain of the ship. Human beings. But, Captain, we both know that I am not human. Spock, you want to know something? Everybody's human. I find that remark insulting. <laughs>